This presentation is about malaria in Ethiopia, which is a really useful one for you to listen to because it covers an LIDC and a communicable disease case studies to support disease dilemmas for OCR. We're going to look briefly today at the disease type, how the disease actually spreads, um, the pattern within Ethiopia as a country and what factors are affecting the incidence of the disease in Ethiopia. So remember, diseases can be described as being communicable, and within that family of diseases, there are different types. Um, some diseases are waterborne, like cholera, airborne, like flu, like the H1N1 2009 pandemic, which occurred and affected many countries around the world. We also have a, a, <clears throat> the epidemic of AIDS, sexually transmitted disease. Today we're thinking about malaria, where the mosquito is the vector which carries the disease and is involved in its transmission. Malaria is an infectious disease and it's caused by parasites. Those parasites come from a group of organisms called the plasmodium family and they're transmitted by usually by a mosquito and the most common type of mosquito is the Anopheles mosquito. The life cycle of the mosquito is a complicated one and the life cycle of the parasite is also complicated and the life cycle of the parasite takes place in two organisms in the mosquito and in the human. It's important to understand some of the basics of this to be able to understand how the direct and the indirect strategies to tackle this disease work. So first of all let's start off in the stagnant pool. So here in the stagnant pool we have an adult mosquito lays eggs. Those eggs are laid into the water. The water in the water after a few days, usually around 10 days, the larvae will hatch from the egg. So the egg turns into larvae. Larvae will then hatch into flies, the mosquito fly. The mosquito will then look for food and the food that it wants is a blood meal and it wants human blood. So it flies here onto the human and it takes the blood meal into its body and you can see here, here is its blood meal. It is eating blood from someone who is infected with malaria. So the mosquito is now a carrier for that malaria. Here you can see infected erythrocytes these are the red blood cells which were infected with the malarial parasite and these are the normal red blood cells. Once within the human body, the parasite will migrate to the human liver and in the human liver it undergoes a change from being what's called a schizont, part of the parasite, to being a merozoite. So these merozoites go into the red blood cells which are found within the blood, human blood, and they become what's called as a merozoite. In that stage of the parasite's life cycle, they cause the rupture of the red blood cells. And that rupture of red blood cells makes people feel very ill. They have fatigue, they have high fever, they have severe headache. They may need transfusion like this person here. Especially vulnerable are elderly people and people under five in the population. For the working age population, also malarial outbreaks can be significant because this infection parasitic infection in the human body can mean that you can't go to work so it will affect your economic productivity and if you've got high levels of endemic malaria in your population this may affect your productivity of your workforce. We're concerned in this presentation about Ethiopia. Here you can see Ethiopia and we're going to focus in on the map of Ethiopia but notice Ethiopia is within a world region which where there is endemic malaria and where there are the highest death rates of malaria globally. You can see that a malaria is concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa with the highest death rates per 100,000 people um, found in that region. And Ethiopia is in eastern Africa and has the, one of the lower death rates um, down here per 100,000 people um, for that region. Let's look now at malaria within Ethiopia. You can see some red areas where there's high rates of um, risk of parasite um, parasites being found in Ethiopia. You can see there's some where there's none. And let's think and explore about this distribution a bit more. So we've put here two maps side by side. One is the map of parasite incidents and the other is the map of climate types within Ethiopia. And you will see that there's some congruence between these two maps. So, for example, here we have the monsoon, a wet area which experiences seasonal monsoon with high rates of malaria. We also have um, highland areas, subtropical highlands, where we have low rates. This is the dark green areas where we have low rates of malaria. 
And then we also have arid areas, areas where um, we have very dry conditions, semi-arid conditions. And here also we see a mixture, but we mainly see low or moderate rates of malarial parasite incidence in those areas. So for your revision, let's simplify this down into three zones. We can divide Ethiopia as the country into three zones. Zone one, where we have the lowland areas with monsoon rain. These areas, in these areas, we have endemic disease with high rates of parasitic infection in the mosquitoes which are found in that region. In the highland areas, the high upland areas, we have very low rates or almost no malaria. So here we have lots, here we have none, and here we have some uh, malaria, and we'll explore why that is. So here is your summary map. What is it that determines the lots, none, some distribution from west to east across um, Ethiopia? Well, the answer is three physical factors. First of all, altitude. As we go up the mountains, for every 100 metres you climb up the mountain, the temperature usually drops by about one degree. That's called the lapse rate. And at high elevations in the Ethiopian highlands, we've got elevations which exceed 2,400 metres. Above that elevation, you're not going to get any parasite development because it's too cold. Secondly, temperature. The parasite needs 21 to 28 degrees of centigrade to develop within the mosquito. Malaria is not found at these high latitudes because the parasite life cycle gets interrupted by the low temperatures. Finally, we have rainfall. And in Ethiopia, the key rainy season is June and August. And the key transmission season for malaria occurs with a lag in September to December. So right after the rainy season. And that's because there are many stagnant pools. Malarial mosquitoes love to lay their eggs in water which is not flowing. And as a result, this is when main transmission occurs. There is also a little bit of transmission which occurs... Um, in after the short rainy season from February to March, but most of it is um, in what we call in the Northern Hemisphere would be our autumn, September to December. So to recap and to give the icing on the cake, remember that the Western lowlands um, include the provinces of Amhara, Tigray and Gembela. The peak transmission season is June um, and November. The central highlands are about a quarter of the land area of Ethiopia and in a quarter of the land area there's virtually no malaria whatsoever. In the eastern lowlands like the Afar and the Somali provinces, these areas are arid. They're simply too dry for transmission to occur most of the year. In rare storms in these areas we can get stagnant pools and that's when malaria spreads to those regions but most of the time it's not found in those areas. However, as you'd imagine, physical factors are not the whole story. There are four key human factors that you need to also bring to bear on why it is that Ethiopia has malaria. Firstly, seasonal migration. This area here is a key growing area for sorghum and for wheat, the key cereal crops which are exported and eaten within Ethiopia. In these areas where the cereal is grown, there is migration, migration of labour from the upland areas into the lowland areas. When people migrate, they can be infected with malaria. Secondly, people harvest after dark when it's cooler. But after dark and at twilight times is the key feeding times when the mosquitoes are looking for their blood meals. So you have a higher risk of being bitten and a higher risk of being infected. Thirdly, both international and national programmes within Ethiopia have been concerned with developing irrigation and improving the transmission of water and the provision of water for agriculture to grow rice particularly. So irrigation canals have been dug and irrigation channels have been dug in this area um, of Ethiopia, in the Awash Valley. In this area, unfortunately, this has led to transmission of the disease into those areas because the water in the irrigation channels is not moving um, very fast. It's quite stagnant and therefore leads to the breeding of the host, the mosquito host. And finally, in Addis Ababa, in the capital city, increasing use of plastics and plastic containers which are left discarded in the urban environment actually act as ideal breeding sites. When it rains in those areas in the capital city, even though it's an upland area, you can get the transmission of mosquitoes from plastic containers where their active breeding sites occur. 
However, it is a very encouraging picture in Ethiopia. And we have um, some important statistics, which is if we look back to 2002, 24,000 people were dying um, in the population. Um, and you can see by age, the most significant age was the youngest age groups, the under fives. The under fives are still represented, but now we've got more people in the middle working ages who are dying but the overall total in 2017 has dropped to only 2,700 people dying each year in Ethiopia from the disease. A few key things to remember you need stagnant pools for the vector the mosquito to hatch and then to um, bite the human. Secondly those pools and that time when the transmission occurs coincides with the times for harvesting um, in Ethiopia when most people are out in the fields. So this leads to large numbers of people being infected at that time. This affects the productivity of Ethiopia and particularly in rural agricultural areas, both in children, older working children and working adults. And this results in a heavy economic burden for the country. Here's a review slide for you to complete. I'm just going to give you a moment and then I'm going to highlight which ones are the correct answers. Malaria is communicable. Secondly, malaria is caused by infection. It's not contagious. Malaria relies on the Anopheles mosquito as a vector. Malaria is actually caused by the plasmodium parasite which lives within the mosquito and the human hosts. Malaria is very affected by seasonal outbreaks and they are linked to the rainy season in Ethiopia. As we said, peak transmission occurs September to December in most parts of Ethiopia, just after the rainy season, which is June to August. The Anopheles mosquito loves warm, humid conditions which are found in the west of the country where it experiences monsoon season. Malaria has been described as being endemic, but now we usually experience epidemics, so outbreaks of disease, but these are reducing, um, and they've been reducing since 2004, since that peak um, number of people that were dying, around 24,000 were dying in 2004, and as I said now, it's a tenth of that, it's down to 2,700 per year. Malaria is found in the lowland areas of Ethiopia mainly due to altitude controlling temperature. Malaria spreads very rapidly in the wet season due to more plentiful breeding sites, especially where there's stagnant pools. Enjoy learning all about disease dilemmas with OCR geography.